Chapter 35 That settles it, Minnow said. Thomas stood next to him on the edge of the cliffs, staring at the gray nothingness beyond. There was no sign of anything, to the left, right, down, up, or ahead, for as far as he could see, nothing but a wall of blackness. Settles what? Thomas asked. We've seen it three times now. Something's up. Yeah, Thomas knew what he meant, but waited for Minnow's explanation anyway. That dead griever I found? It ran this way and we never saw it come back or go deeper into the maze. Then those suckers we tricked into jumping past us. Tricked, Thomas said. Maybe not such a trick. Minnow looked over at him, contemplative. Hmm. Anyway, then this. He pointed out to the abyss. Not much doubt anymore. Somehow the grievers can leave the maze this way. Looks like magic, but so does the sun disappearing. If they can leave this way, Thomas asked, excuse me, added, continuing Minho's line of reasoning, so could we. A thrill of excitement shot through him. <laughs> Minho laughed. There's your death wish again. Want to hang out with the Grievers? Have a sandwich, maybe? Thomas felt his hopes drop. Got any better ideas? One thing at a time, Greeny. Let's get some rocks and test this place out. There has to be some kind of hidden exit. Thomas helped Minnow as they scram scrabbled around the corners and crannies of the maze, picking up as many loose stones as possible. They got more by cracking excuse me, they got more by thumbing cracks in the wall, spilling broken chunks onto the ground. When they finally had a sizable pile, they hauled it up right next to the edge and took a seat, feet dangling over the side. Thomas looked down and saw nothing but a gray descent. Minnow pulled out his pad and pencil, placed them on the ground next to him. All right, we got to take good notes. And memorize it in the shuck head of yours, too. If there's some kind of optical illusion hiding an exit from this place, I don't want to be the one who screws up when the first shank tries to jump into it. That shank ought to be the keeper of the runners, Thomas said, trying to make a joke to hide his fear. Being this close to a place where grievers might come out at any second was making him sweat. You want to hold on to one beauty of a rope? Minnow picked up a rock from their pile. Yeah. Okay, let's take turns tossing them, zigzagging back and forth out there. If there's some kind of magical exit, hopefully it'll work with rocks, too, and make them disappear. Thomas took a rock and carefully threw it over to the left, just in front of where the left wall to the corridor leads to the cliff, leading to the cliff met the edge. A jagged piece of stone fell, and fell, then disappeared into the gray emptiness. Minho went next. He tossed his rock just a foot or so farther than Thomas had. It also fell far below. Thomas threw another one, another foot out, then Minho. Each rock fell to the depths. Thomas kept following Minho's orders. They continued until they marked a line, reaching out at least a dozen feet from the cliff, then moved from the target pattern a foot to the right, then started to come back toward the maze. All the rocks fell, another line out, another line back. All the rocks fell. They threw enough rocks to cover the entire left half of the area in front of them, covering the distance anyone or anything could possibly jump. Thomas's discouragement grew with every toss, until it turned into a heavy mass of blah. He couldn't help chiding himself. It had been a stupid idea. Then Minho's next rock disappeared. It was the strangest, most hard-to-believe thing Thomas had ever seen. Minho had thrown a large chunk, a place that had fallen from one of the cracks in the wall. Thomas had watched, deeply concentrating on each and every rock. This one left Minho's hand, sailed forward, almost in the exact center of the cliff line, started its descent to the unseen ground far below, then it vanished, as if it had fallen through a plane of water or mist. One second there falling, next second gone. Thomas couldn't speak. We've thrown stuff off the cliff before, Minho said. How could we have ever missed that? I saw nothing disappear, never. Thomas coughed. His throat felt raw. Do it again. Maybe we blinked weird or something. Minho did, throwing it at the same spot, and once again, it winked out of existence. Maybe you weren't looking carefully other times you threw stuff over, Thomas said. I mean, it should be impossible. Sometimes you don't look very hard for things you don't believe will or can happen. They threw the rest of the rocks, aiming at the original, the original spot and every inch around it. 
To Thomas's surprise, the spot in which the ro rocks had disappeared proved only to be a few foot square. No wonder we missed it, Minnow said, furiously writing down notes and dimensions, his best attempt at a diagram. It's kind of small. The Grievers must barely fit through that thing. Thomas kept his eyes riveted to the area of the invisible floating square, trying to burn the distance and location into his mind. Remember exactly where it was. And when they come out, they must balance on the rim of the hole and jump over the empty space to the cliff edge. It's not that far. If I could jump it, I'm sure it's easy for them. Minnow finished drawing, then looked up at the special spot. How's this possible, dude? What are we looking at? Like you said, it's not magic. Must be something like our sky turning gray. Some kind of optical illusion or hologram hiding a doorway. This place is all jacked up. And Thomas admitted to himself, kind of cool. His mind craved to know what kind of technology could be behind it all. Yeah, jacked up is right. Come on. Minnow got up with a grunt and put on his backpack. Better get as much of the maze run as we can. With our new decorated sky, may maybe other weird things have happened out there. We'll tell Newt and Albie about this tonight. Don't know how it helps, but at least we know where the shut grievers go. And possibly where they come from. Thomas said as he took one last look at the hidden doorway. The Griever Hole. Yeah, good, as na good a name as any. Let's go. Thomas sat and stared, waiting for Minnow to make a move. Several minutes passed in silence, and Thomas realized his friend must be as fascinated as he was. Finally, without saying a word, Minho turned to leave. Thomas reluctantly followed, and they ran into the gray dark maze. Thomas and Minho found nothing but stones, stone walls and ivy. Thomas did the vine cutting and all the note taking. It was hard for him to notice any changes from the day before, but Minho pointed out without thinking about it where the walls had moved. When they reached the final dead end and it was time to head back home, Thomas felt an almost uncontrollable urge to bag everything and stay there overnight and see what happened. Minnow seemed to sense it and grabbed his shoulder. Not yet, dude. Not yet. And so they'd gone back. A somber mood rested over the glade, an easy thing to happen when all is gray. The dim light hadn't changed a bit since they'd woken up that morning, and Thomas wondered if anything would change at sunset either. Minho headed straight for the map room as they came through the west door. Thomas was surprised. He thought it the last thing they should do. Aren't you dying to tell Newt and Albie about the Griever Hole? Hey, we're still runners, and we still have a job, Minnow said. Thomas followed him to the steel door of the big concrete block, and Minnow turned to give him a wan smile. But yeah, we'll do it quick so we can talk to them. They were already, there were already other runners milling about the room, drawing up their maps when they entered. No one said a word, as if all speculation on the new sky had been exhausted. The hopelessness in the room made Thomas feel as if he were walking through mud thick water. He knew he could also he knew he should be also exhausted, but he was too excited to feel it. He couldn't wait to see Newton Albee's reaction to the news about the cliff. He sat down at the table and drew up the maps the day's maps based on his memory and notes, Minho looking over his shoulder the whole time, giving pointers. I think that hall was actually cut off the here, not there. And watch your proportions. And draw straighter, you shank. He was annoying, but helpful. And 15 minutes after entering the room, Thomas examined his fin finished product. Pride washed through him. It was just as good as any other map he'd seen. Not bad, Minho said. For a greenie, anyway. Minho got up and walked over to Section 1 trunk and opened it. Thomas knelt down in front of it and took out the map from the day before and held it up side by side with the ones he'd just drawn. What am I looking for, he asked. Patterns. But looking at two days worth isn't going to tell you jack. You really need to study several weeks. Look for patterns. Anything. I know there's something there, something that'll help us. Just can't find it yet. Like I said, it sucks. Thomas had an itch in the back of his mind, the same he'd felt the very first time in this room. The maze walls, moving, patterns, all those straight lines. Were they just suggesting an entirely different kind of map, pointing to something? He had such a heavy feeling that he missed an obvious hint or clue. Minho tapped him on the shoulder. You can always come, up, come back and study your butt off after dinner, after we talk to Newt and Albie. Come on. Thomas put the papers in the trunk and closed it, hating the twinge of uneasy he felt. 
It was like a prick in his side. Walls moving, straight lines, patterns. There had to be an answer. Okay, let's go. They just stepped out the, outside the map room, the heavy door clanging shut behind them when Newton and Albie walked up, neither one of them looking very happy. Thomas's excitement immediately turned to worry. Hey, Minho said, we were just... Get on with it, Albie interrupted. Ain't got time to waste. Find anything? Anything? Minho actually recoiled at the harsh rebuke, and his face seemed more confused than Thomas, to Thomas than hurt or angry. Nice to see you, too. Yeah, we did find something, actually. Oddly, Albie almost looked disappointed, because this whole shuck place has fallen to pieces. He shot Thomas a nasty glare as if it was all his fault. What's wrong with him? Thomas thought, feeling his anger light up. They'd been working hard all day, and this was their thanks. What do you mean? Minho asked. What else happened? Newt answered, nodding towards the box as he did so. Bloody supplies didn't come today. Come every week for two years, same time, same day, but not today. All four of them looked at the steel doors attached to the ground. To Thomas, there seemed to be a heavy hovering, heavy shadow hovering over it, darker than the gray air surrounding everything else. Oh, we're shucked for good now, Minnow whispered, his reaction alerting Thomas to how grave the situation really was. No sun for the plants, Newt said. No supplies for the bloody box. Yeah, I'd say we're shucked all right. Albie had folded his arms, still glaring at the box as if trying to open the doors with his mind. Thomas hoped the leader didn't bring up what he'd seen in the changing, or anything related to Thomas for that matter, especially now. Yeah. Anyway, Minho continued, we found something weird. Thomas waited, hoping Newton and Albie would have a positive reaction to the news, maybe even further information to shed light on the mystery. Newt raised his eyebrows. What? Minnow took a full three minutes to explain, starting with the griever they followed and ending with the results of the rock-throwing experiment. Must lead to the... well, you know. Grievers live, he said when finished. The griever hole, Thomas added. All three of them looked at him, annoyed, as if he had no right to speak. But for the first time, being treated like the greenie didn't bother him that much. Gotta bloody see that for myself, Newt said, then murmured, hard to believe... Thomas couldn't have agreed more. I don't know what we can do, Minho said. Maybe we could build something to block off that corridor. No way, Newt said. Shuck things can climb over the bloody walls, remember? Nothing we could build would keep them out. But a commotion outside the homestead shifted their attention away from the conversation. A group of gladers stood at the front door of the house, shouting to be heard over each other. Chuck was in the group and when he saw Thomas and the others, he ran over, a look of excitement spread across his face. Thomas could only wonder what crazy thing had happened now. What's going on? Newt asked. She's awake! Chuck yelled. The girl's awake! Thomas's insides twisted. He leaned, across the, he leaned against the concrete wall of the map room. The girl. The girl who spoke in his head. He wanted to run before it happened again, before she spoke to him in his mind. But it was too late. Tom, I don't know any of these people. Come get me. It's all fading. I'm forgetting everything but you. I have to tell you things, but it's all fading. He couldn't understand how she did it, how she was inside his mind. Teresa paused, then said something that made no sense. The maze is a code, Tom. The maze is a code. <laughs>